Hello and welcome into the latest edition of ESPN FC. Kay Murray and Stevie Nicol here in the studio. We are also joined by Julian Laurent, Craig Burley and Ian Dark. And we're going to start with a topic that we've been discussing all week and that is the future of Darwin Nunez. Latest today is that Liverpool are the front runners to get his signature and have him on their books for next season. Is this actually happening, Jules? Well, I think it's certainly on, on a good path. Let's put it that way for now. There's still some things to sort out. Of course, this is a big transfer we're talking about over or around the 100 million euro mark, which for Liverpool, for example, this is, this is really unprecedented. unprecedented. They, they have made big, big deals before. Alisson, Virgil, of course, others. But this is, this is the, the next level, certainly in terms of, of buying players. So there's still obviously a lot of things to sort out, but it looks like already the player and Liverpool have, have agreed terms on the long-term contract. There's no problem there. And then Benfica will try to get as much money uh, from Liverpool as possible. But you, could already see, you can already see all the pieces of the jigsaw getting together. Uh, Craig, we're just thinking about this price that we're talking about, 100 million that Jules has just mentioned there. I thought they didn't have the money to keep the likes of both Mane and Salah. And now we're talking about potentially 100 million for a player. What do you think of this? Yeah, but it's not, it's not apples and oranges, is it? You know, it, 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 it's, you know, you're talking about two guys that have, and Stevie's mentioned this, that have given the club some great service in recent years. You're talking about guys that, particularly Mo Salah, you know, how long can you keep doing it? We're talking about investment here, a bit like Man City in the future, as well as quality, as well as goals. They've gone for Haaland. Looks like Liverpool are going to go for, for Nunes. I think he's 22. Big, tall lad. You know, scores all different types of goals, as we touched on in the show the other day. Some spectacular ones, you know, attacks the ball well in the air, uh, scores from outside the box, inside the box, takes penalties, does a bit of everything, he's got good pace. And Stevie and I have talked about this before, as good as Liverpool were at times last year, and I suppose City to an extent coming up short in the Champions League as well, there's still space for that kind of player. You know, all the false nines and the rotating front threes. You still need somebody like when you're struggling, you can throw it in the box or it's going to do something different. That's why they're worth this money. That's why they're worth their weight in gold. And if you can get a young one that's possibly going to be around for six to ten years, that's a really good... You've got to look at that investment rather than the initial investment of the big layout. We're talking years here, Kay, potentially. And that's, I think, how you can sell it to, to ownership rather than saying, oh, we have a 29-year-old here or a 30-year-old, he's going to cost me £100 million in a transfer, that starts alarm bells ringing because there's really no sell-on uh, if indeed the player wants to leave. Who would you rather have, Stevie, right now, Mane or Nunez? Well, that's an unfair question. If I'm in charge of Liverpool, I'm letting Mane go, I'm trying to get the £40 million for Mane, and if it costs me 100 which well, I think right now is too much, but if it costs me 100 eventually then it's costing me 60. I'm getting somebody at probably half the wages that Manny wants now, and he's 22 years old, and Manny's getting up towards 30. I've also got cover for Manny and, and Diaz and Jota. We need a centre forward. This guy's as good as age, at his age as it is around. So absolutely I'm taking Darwin Nunes. So if it, you can't look at everyone the same way. There, there are different circumstances around all your signings. And so for those reasons I've given you, I signed Darwin Nunes tomorrow, no danger. At Liverpool just building for the future here, Ian. Yeah, and I think there's an important uh, factor in this as well. I think there's always the need, and I think players will, will tell you this, that they like to see a new face or two just to freshen things up in the dressing room. And I think Nunez will bring that. It does seem as if Sadio Mane does want to go. And I know they're still haggling about the fee, but it does look as if he is going to be going to Bayern Munich. Um, you know, as Jules was saying, it's progressing, isn't it? This Nunez deal. He wants to go to Liverpool. He wants to play in the Champions League. He proved himself in the Champions League because his his speed, his lethal finishing was instrumentally getting Benfica to the quarterfinals, even if they struggled a bit in the Portuguese league. He's got a lot of qualities. He ticks a lot of boxes. He is frighteningly quick. And interestingly, he likes to attack. 
from that kind of inside left, left-sided channel. So he can be a centre forward and a winger, almost wrapped into one. So I think it's some player they're going to be getting. Uh, just to go back on that price as well, Jules, I know they're talking about 100 million, but there is a thought that it could just be with add-ons that it gets up to that, right? Yeah, that's right. It will be the, the whole package will cost 100 million. And Craig made a great point about Sadio Mane. This is the money that you're going to get for Mane, which, by the way, you've already... The amortization of the Mane deal from Southampton six years ago is done already. So all the money that you bring in now in terms of transfer for money, transfer fee for money, it's all coming straight into your, into your bank account, basically. You can, you, you can reinvest it straight away. So I think you should, this, is, this is a deal that should be seen that way. It's not 100 million euros that will leave Liverpool's bank account straight away to go to Benfica. It will be the money, the, the money from money, because there's no doubt money is going to go now. They, they're not going to sign Nunez and keep the six of them with Firmino, Salah, Jota and Diaz for next season. This is not going to happen. So clearly this is... The, 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 the first part, the Nunez is the beginning of the, the departure for money, really. Uh, and then you use that money, you reinvest that money the way, the way you want, whatever position. But clearly, uh, they, they've uh, have identified Nunez as the perfect replacement. Let's not forget, he can also play wide. He's not as efficient in front of goals, but he brings a lot because of the physicality, because of the running and the, the pressing as well that he does. He can easily play wide if needed. So it's a, it's a signing that makes a lot of sense. And again... A bit like what we saw when they invested the Coutinho money or the Suarez money, they will reinvest the money money, which is not as big, of course, but it's still 40 million euros is a, is a, is a large amount of money to be able to get the one for the future. Uh, well, hopefully, speaking of money, too many of you at home didn't put bets on the Premier League predictions from this panel at the beginning of the right. season. We've decided... Name names. We've decided we got it to right. go back... And revisit some oh, of sorry, your I got it right. predictions. You sorry. got the champion right. I hope you didn't listen to me. I got it right. You had Manchester United ahead of Liverpool, and you weren't the only one. So hold on a second. There are there are different levels of importance in these uh, in these so-called predictions, right? Okay. And all the important ones I got correct. I got the champion. I got the top scorer, and I got the player of the year. So if you're going to start giving me stick for getting third, fourth, and fifth wrong, then fire away, please. A Premier League player well, of the year, Kevin De Bruyne. Well, the the player of the year is subjective, isn't it? Because the the your team at Windsor, the, the league positions are the league positions on merit. The uh, the player of the year is a vote, I believe. Anyway, anyway, again, Craig, again, I got, I'm with Stevie. I got it right because who who wants to know who finished second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth? So I got it, Man City. I thought I thought Liverpool. I thought Liverpool, I was unsure in Liverpool only because of all the injuries last year and, and I would never in a month of Sunday thought Man United would have been as garbage as they were. Uh, they shouldn't have been. I mean, it was quite a disgrace, uh, their performances last year. And I've got a bit of sellotape over the bottom two, I can't see them, so... <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> hey, keep the sellotape there. Yeah, keep the sellotape there. <laughs> well, well, Romelu Lukaku listen, was your top scorer, player of the year, Ruben Diaz, but we well, want to go listen, back to the Romelu, Romelu Lukaku. Romelu Lukaku was flying till Thomas Tuchel threw a load of gasoline on the fire around Christmas, and Ruben Diaz, up until his injury, was fantastic, so I'm, a, I'm happy with that. All right, let's see Jules, I'm happy with because... It. Jules did not get the champion of England right yeah. in his prediction. Did he get anything right? Jules went for Chelsea. He got nothing got right. Place. He got zero. No, no, Arsenal in fifth. Arsenal in fifth. <laughs> <laughs> I'm oh, the only I, one. Take, I take it all back. <laughs> Thank Top you. Top scorer Lukaku, Respect. player of the year Lukaku. What went uh, wrong, Jules, with your predictions? I'll tell you what went wrong. Lukaku went wrong. I mean... I got so excited and I really thought, and I was not the only one, we thought they could compete with Liverpool and City, well, City especially. Uh, but little we knew, little I knew, that it was going to be the most dysfunctional relationship ever between a manager and a striker worth £105 million. It was ridiculous the way, as Craig mentioned, the way it all went pay shape pretty quickly. And, and it looked great on paper after the signing, but... Of course, the season showed that it was a car crash. So that, yeah, that got me. Well, don't worry, Jules. You weren't the only one who went for Chelsea as champions. <laughs> Ian Dark, you also <laughs> Who's that Chelsea on the right? Your champions looking mighty fine there in your photograph. And you had Lukaku as your top scorer. 
Yeah, well, I, I always say the same thing. These predictions are there to make the fools of us. And I think looking at that list, I probably have been made a bit of a fool. I, I would say this. Chelsea looked like they were going to be champions. I, you know, they were top of the table on December the 4th. And then it, it all seemed to fall apart a little bit. But Lukaku, well, uh, I've never said no comment in my life. But I think I'm going to now. I tell you what, though, I feel as though I'm letting you off a little bit with United. I got three right. No, that's fine. Nobody got close to okay, me. Okay, they were right. <laughs> Why did you pick United ahead of Liverpool? Because oh, look, Craig's just said it. That's Liverpool's said it. injuries. Why did you do that? Liverpool's injuries. You couldn't. You couldn't bet on them. You couldn't bet on them. Matic couldn't stay in. Like Matic was fantastic this year. He couldn't play two games in a row last year. Gomez. Gomez did his uh, his his Achilles. So, we didn't know what we had. I mean, seriously, all the problems they had. We said at the time that they had, had such a small squad as well. I mean, there was so many things wrong. And then, of course, Man United go out and make some signings. And then you think, they can't be any worse. Which everybody thought. And, of course, they were. So, no, well, absolutely not. The rationale behind the, the decisions, I thought, were... Uh, we're pretty good. And as I said, I got three correct. Yep. Yours actually were Nobody's better. close to me. No, they weren't, because all of the others were actually bullish on Romelu Lukaku being top scorer here. Jules, do you see him at Chelsea next season? What's the latest on his future? I, I don't think he wants to be there. So why would you keep him? Peter Cech came out today and said, yeah, you know, Lukaku next season, etc." Okay, if you want to, if you want to keep him and force him to stay, you can. But he doesn't want to be there. So I'm not even sure if he really wanted to be there when the transfer happened, to be honest. So let's see what happens. There's clearly just one club right now who I think is willing to try to make it happen and it's Inter Milan. I think he would love to go back there. It can only happen on a loan. We've said that before, we've explained for many reasons and especially the, the, the main one is that Inter don't have the money for a transfer. Can that happen? Can, can, you make, can you work out a loan when the player is worth so much, when he's on so much money wages wise? I, I don't know, but it's them or nothing, really. I can't see Bayern Munich, I guess, if Lewandowski was to leave, then they would need a, a really strong, big, like big as in with the name and everything, number nine. So maybe they could look into it. But again, who's going to pay 60, 80 and even 60? I'm not sure Chelsea would agree to it. So 80 million is on 15 or 60 million net a year. This is a lot of money already. So I don't know. I think Inter... Inter was probably right, right now the most likely destination if they could make that happen. But why would you want to keep him? Why would you keep him if he doesn't want to be there? Uh, Jules, I want to stick with you because yesterday we talked about the PFA team of the year and I know you were incensed with one of the big omissions in that team of the year. <laughs> Talk to us about that. Yeah, and it's not Emmerich Laporte who is clearly himself very upset that he didn't make the two, one of the two spots I sent the back, I guess Rudiger maybe more than Van Dijk, and uh, clearly uh, was whinging on, on social media today about it and got slaughtered by, by the people who follow him and who answered his, his tweets. A anyway, I think it's Hang Min Son, we said it before, for him not to make the, uh, the shortlist for the player of the year nominees, that was bad in the first place already. But then not to include him in the, in the 11, and have Cristiano up front with, instead, for example, I suspect, I guess, uh, or even, even maybe there's a case for, I don't know, Mane maybe, to be there ahead of Son. I mean, I think Son has been incredible. We mentioned Golden Boot without taking penalties all season. It's remarkable, plus the assist. And for him not to be in this 11 of the season is, is completely shambolic and outrageous. Uh, Craig, what were your thoughts on Son net making it into the 11 there? Voted we... by the players this. Can we just go back? Can I just backtrack on Lukaku a little bit? Because I don't really give a stuff about the team of the year, to be honest with you. Uh, <laughs> I don't care. Uh, yeah, I think he should have been. I think he should have been certainly in the voting, if not in it, with his performances. But but that's that's what it is. Let me just go back on Lukaku, please, uh, for for a minute. This is just a huge. This is another huge problem in, for Chelsea and Tuchel because. You have a player, as Jill said, on the face of it, seems like he doesn't 
really want to be there. And as Joe's mentioned, that could have been the case from day one. Who knows? It certainly looks that way now. But the money is so big, wages, transfer fee, for any person taking them, that if he doesn't go out, it's not, it's not a matter of, well, we can't do a deal so he stays, and, oh, uh, butter him a bit of toast at the training ground and, and, and stir his tea and everything's going to be okay. You're, left with, you're not going to challenge with Kai Havertz and Timo Werner and a sulking Romelu Lukaku. And this is a huge problem for Thomas Tuchel. It's a huge promise for, problem for the new ownership of Chelsea. Yeah, they might say, OK, well, you know, let's make a splash for the fans and you know, we'll, we'll, have to, we'll have to soak up the Lukaku wages and know that he's not going to play a lot, but we're going to have to go out and buy somebody else. Then you're loading the club up with even more uh, financial issues with another top-line striker because they need a top-line striker. Trust me, there's not, they're not going to go a full season against the teams that we mentioned in England with the guys that are at that club. I mean, you couldn't even tell me what the best Chelsea front three is. They rotated all season. They were so inconsistent. Zayets with injuries and Havertz and, and, and Lukaku and Werner. And I've heard Peter Cech and all the nonsense about COVID and all the... That's spare me. He's been in the dressing room. He knows that's all guff, right? The bottom line is here, there's not enough consistent performers. You look at Liverpool, you look at City. Consistent performers in the front line. And when they're not performing, somebody else comes in and has consistency. Like Jota, like Diaz. Firmino's struggling, out he comes, somebody else comes in. All Chelsea had all year, the most consistent player was probably Mason Mount. And he's not a striker, he's, a, he's, a, he's an in-between. He's a wide, he's, a, he's in behind a striker, he's in midfield. So this Lukaku thing is more than just, oh, how do we get rid of Romelu Lukaku? And what if we can't get rid of him and he stays? What if you can't get rid of him and he stays? What are you going to do about it? As a team, as a club. Because Thomas Tuchel is going to be screwed next year. If he gets the same results... Pretty much, and they're 20 points behind the league and they're out of the Champions League and other teams are having success. This new ownership are going to have to make a stand to show the fans that they mean business. So this is problematic for the club, for Thomas Tuchel, for the team. Not so much for Romelu Lukaku because, hey, he's getting paid a gazillion dollars and I'm sure he'll find his way. But, but for trust me, for Thomas Tuchel and Chelsea Football Club, Bear in mind what Liverpool are doing in the market, what Man City have done in the market already and already with their squads. They are going to have to get their finger out big time and figure this one out. Otherwise, they're going to be also runs again next year. It is a tricky situation, isn't it, Ian? Yeah, it is. I mean, Chelsea are in a state of flux, of course, under, under the new owners. Everybody's watching, seeing how they're going to conduct themselves this summer. I think there's no doubt at all if they got the right kind of offer for Romelu Lukaku, they would let him go. But is that going to happen? Because what's happened this last season is he's become damaged goods for the time being. Yeah, Chelsea have got a problem. If they don't get the right offer, he's, he's stuck there. I think they've got to somehow find a way of trying to dovetail him into their system and hoping that he returns to something like the form we saw in most of his other seasons, not all of them, in the Premier League and the form he's showed at Inter. Um, so, yeah, you'd struggle at the moment to see Chelsea being serious contenders to the big two uh, in the coming season. Uh, well, we thank Craig for being with us. He will be back for the latest edition of Extra will Time I? alongside oh. Ian. Yes, you will. And uh, Stevie as well. Uh, Stevie getting a little confused in today's Extra Time, shall we see? Go see it over on our YouTube page. France were looking for their first win in the new Nations League campaign. It didn't come against Austria and they actually got away with just the point because late on Austria had a massive chance to win the game and didn't manage to do so. Anyway, it was a great goal from Kylian Mbappe that did rescue a point for France, but that result means that they are still rooted to the bottom of the table. Julian Laurent is with us to talk more about this. Jules, I actually want to talk about when Griezmann came off, it seemed that France looked a lot better. And yes, that meant Kylian Mbappe was on the pitch. 
But is there a danger for Griezmann that he won't have a starting spot come the Winter World Cup? Massively, okay. that's one of the big um, things that we take away from the game tonight in France. Certainly, we knew that Griezmann was going through a really bad patch. He hasn't scored since since uh, January the 4th or January the 6th, I think, at club level. Same with the national team, struggling. We saw in the, the hour that he played that he was struggling. He lost the ball on the, well, kind of him. It's a, it's a, it's a poor pass towards Benzema in our own half that then, that then leads Austria to their goal, even if there's a mistake again by Teo Hernandez, but still he's, he's at the start of that hole, and then he did nothing, absolutely nothing. I don't think he should have started tonight, but Deschamps has obviously a very strong relationship with him, and we know Deschamps and how he works with, with those players that have been there for a long time. He tries to, he's very loyal to them, hasn't he? He's always done it, so we play him again tonight, hoping that they will be uh, the turning point maybe that he would create or score a goal or give an assist or something and in the end it was a disaster again and when Nkunku came on straight away the, the game brightened up for PhD yes there was Mbappe too at the same time and they combined so well on the on the France goal together I think right now Nkunku should start ahead of Griezmann in whatever formation Deschamps picks whether it's a back four or back three but clearly Nkunku right now is far more valuable to this team than Griezmann is I tell you what, Jules. I bet he, I bet he wishes this was just a bad patch. This is, he's been horrendous. I mean, since he mm. went to Barcelona, he's been horrendous. How long ago is that? Is it three, four years ago? He hasn't done anything. And even with France, he seems as though. Listen, the, the loyalty that Deschamps has shown is the only reason. He's. He's in the squad, never mind the, uh, on the field. And for France, every now and again, he's kind of like one of those players that get a coach the sack. Just whenever you think he's done, he'll do something that puts you on the edge of your seat again. Every now and again. That's, yeah. that's where this guy is. Every now and again. And you see the difference. There's almost like a cloud following this guy around when he's playing. And you say that again, and we saw it again in this game, when Nkunku comes on and Mbappe... And the cloud disappears, they look a different side. Deschamps is going to have to realise this and do something about it, surely. Jules? Hmm. Yeah, you're right, Stevie, completely. It's a, it's a perfect analysis of the whole situation. Every time the debate is there about Griezmann's position as a starter in that team, he comes out of the box and, and scores or does something special. And so then the debate goes away and then he, he inevitably comes back because, because he's 30 now. As you said, he hasn't been playing well at club level for a while now. The season with Atletico is a struggle uh, between the injuries, between the struggles that Atletico as a, as a whole, as a team, have had as well, plus him on top of it. And now the national team. And the problem is that relationship with Deschamps kept him in that lineup, and he's one of the leaders of the pitch, of course, because he's one of the most, the, the, the most experienced and he's been there for such a long time. But now, when behind you the younger ones are so good and the competition is so high for places, I think Deschamps at some point will have to be, to be ruthless in the sense that, and it's not ruthless because it's so obvious for all to see, but ruthless because it goes against the, the, the way Deschamps deals with this team and manages these squads, where usually if you're one of the most experienced, you've got a place, but now you will have to make that call and cut him off. At the complete other end of things, Jules, we saw once again, and obviously it's no secret at this stage, how good Kylian Mbappe is. Incredible. And what's, what's even funnier, Kay, is that the, the, the last five times he was, a, he was a sub or he came on as a sub, he's, got, he's, he's involved in five goals. So as a starter, he's obviously amazing, but you could even use him if you want as an impact sub. And even if he plays half an hour like tonight or 20 minutes, 25 minutes, 15 minutes, he will, have an, he will impact the game regardless. Anyway, incredible form, uh, even if he's not 100% because he still has a bit of discomfort on his knee that uh, we saw in the first game where he had to come off a half time against, against Denmark. But he's, he's just so good, so indispensable. Even Benzema, when he's not playing with him, doesn't look the same either. So, yeah, Kylian, of course, which we knew. You're right, we knew. But it's always good, especially when the national team is struggling like this. Two points out of three games. It's a good thing for them that Croatia won away in Denmark because otherwise Denmark would be even far more ahead. Now it's only four points between Denmark in first and France in, in last. So everything is still very open in that group. But it thanks, thanks, it's thanks to Kylian to, again, have saved the team tonight.
We're seeing something very special. We're continuing to see something very special with Kylian Mbappe, aren't we, Stevie? Well, he's right now probably the superstar, is he not? You know, yes, Benzema for what he's been done in the Champions League, but if you've got a choice, you've, you're starting Benz, um, Mbappe before anybody in the world. Has to be. Can't think of anybody who I would put ahead of him if I'm picking an 11 right now, and that includes Benzema. We do know that Benzema is sticking around at PSG, Joel. There are multiple reports that were saying Zinedine Zidane would be the new coach coming in at PSG. However, his advisor has actually said there's no truth in this. Nobody's spoken to anybody so far. It's actually something you've written about as well. Can you shed some light on it? Hmm. Yeah, of course, the piece is on the, the website and it's just the latest in, in this mini saga. I mean, it is a saga, but it doesn't have right now for sure the, this kind of amplification of a, of a big saga like the Mbappe one, but certainly we know that he would be ideal as a PSG manager and that the Emir of Qatar, who owns PSG, wants him on that bench. Luis Campos, the new sporting director, not so much, and I think that's a bit of an issue there. But certainly there's voices at the club in Paris who believe that there's still a bit of hope that can convince Zidane to come over and be the next manager and replace Mauricio Pochettino, who we know is going to leave the club. But you still have to convince him. He's got his eyes on the national team job and he knows that as soon as Deschamps is out, the job would be his. So if that's in December after the World Cup, why would Zidane take a club now if, if in six months the job that he really, really wants is available? So there's, uh, there's more to, to go, uh, you know, to talk about between the club and him. Uh, but for sure they're talking, for sure they, he's the priority and they're pushing, pushing, pushing. It might not be enough and, and no one can tell us right now what's going to happen because no one knows, not even Zinedine himself. But there's certainly, you know, a bit of optimism right now at the club, which I, th I don't think is a, is a bad thing. And in the meantime, Luis Campos is working on Christophe Galtier, which would be another option if Zidane really says no at some point. OK, Jules, tell us more about Paul Pogba then. It looks as though he's going back to Juventus. Yeah, which we, we knew again, uh, Rafaela Pimenta, who's his, his, agent, yeah, his agent now, who used to work with Mino, um, has, has met with Juventus a few times. There was always an interest from PSG, and I think Paul was quite keen to go back to Paris and, and play there. He's obviously, you know, he was born there and grew up there, but he was very much the Leonardo option. Now that Leonardo is not in Paris anymore, Luis Campos sees things very differently in terms of midfielder to recruit and Pogba is not in his plans. So Juventus became almost the only option now, which is fine because he's really happy to go back. They're very happy to get him on a free. Again, let's not forget that when he was very young, they also signed him from Manchester United on a, on a free. So I think this one could be done pretty quickly. Let's not forget the documentary is out on June 17th. Uh, the documentary where he would announce the club, so it will be Juventus. Oh, it's going to be interesting, isn't it? Oh, don't. Oh, see, give me a break. I, I can't just. <laughs> All right, we'll give you a break. We'll give you a look at what's oh, going on in the Nations League. Right. Continues tomorrow with a Euro 2020 final rematch between England and Italy. England are the favourites going into this one, even though they lost that final, and even though they are bottom of the group so far, Ian Duck. So, what are we looking out for from England? in this clash? Well, I think Gareth Southgate could do with a convincing performance and a win because England, a little bit like France, haven't been uh, particularly impressive. Losing to Hungary, they were awful in that game. A bit better against Germany, but they were largely outplayed. Got the draw in the end in Munich that night. But um, it's not going to quite be the rematch of the European final because Harry Kane is going to be rested for the game. We understand Tammy Abraham will play uh, up front. I think Jack Grealish, after his excellent cameo against Germany, will be in the side. The Italian team's going to look, look quite a lot different. No uh, Chiellini, uh, Benucci, a few of the other regulars. So, you know, they're in a state of transition after failing to qualify for the World Cup. And it's going to have a bit of a ghostly feeling because the game's going on in an empty stadium, England being punished for the Wembley misdemeanors at the European final. So it's at Wolverhampton Wanderers ground, Molyneux. It'll be in an empty stadium. But England do need the points of the Nations League group. I know the focus is the World Cup this year, but uh, they could do with rescuing it. They are at home. They will be favourites. And I think another player you might see is James Ward-Prowse, who was put up for media duties today, the Southampton 
uh, free kick specialist. So England have got some thinking to do, I think, as well at the moment. Gareth Southgate, you know, there are rising questions really a little bit now. He's got this excellent group of players. Is he going to let them off the leash? That's really the question. Well, we'll find out tomorrow what happens and there'll be a lot more talk about that game on tomorrow's edition of ESPN FC. Make sure to catch us and remember we are available seven days a week. It's Frankie de Jong. I think he will be brilliant at Man United. He's a player Man United needs because uh, the transition between the defense and midfield, just the style of play, the dominant style of play, he's the man who can, who can give it. And as long as uh, Busquets is playing in his role, it's going to be very difficult. For me, it's a no-brainer to go to Man United and, and um, yeah, link up again with, uh, with your former manager and, and just give Man United a new face. Uh, that was Marciano Vink, the former Dutch and international and Ajax player, talking about Frankie de Jong to Manchester United. Those sentiments were shared by Raphael van der Vaart, who said Frankie de Jong is so good with the national team because he's the only midfielder with these types of qualities here, and he does what he wants. At Barca, there's Pedri, Gavi, Busquets, and so on. At Manchester United, it'll be just like at the national team, being the only one with his type of qualities. I would move to Manchester United if I were him. Just do it. Oh. Jules and Ian, still with us for this one. Can you see this happening, Jules? Uh, yes, definitely. It certainly feels like now, Frankie de Jong is a bit more up for the move, let's, let's be honest. I think there was a time where he wanted to join a club. Well, first, he didn't want to leave Barcelona. Then secondly, if, if he was to leave, it was for a club that played in the Champions League, which is not United case, of course. They would be in the Europa League. So I think this, you know, this, this was uh, Europa Conference League, which was, I think that this was an issue too. Um, it seems that now he's, he's a bit more keen to go. And yet, it makes a lot of sense. However, Barcelona need a lot of money and we know how financially the situation is, is dire. So will United accept the terms that Barcelona are, are going to set, which is around 100 million euros, which is a lot of money for a midfielder like him. Secondly, let's not forget that it's not just Frankie de Jong on his own in midfield that are going to make it all good for United. They will need more midfielders. They will need a proper holding midfielder, which is not really what de Jong is about. De Jong, as we've just heard, is, is a great for that transition between defence and midfield. It should be your first option as a pass if you're a United defender. But you also need someone next to him who will also defend a lot because he's great at carrying the ball and his intelligence is off the chart, but he, he still needs someone who works next to him too, which they don't have right now. Don't give me the Scott McTominay, please, here. So it's not just him. However, if you can get him, then he's obviously a huge added value to your squad. Uh, Ian, you've been calling La Liga this season. You've seen Frankie de Jong playing for Barcelona. Can you see him fitting in at Manchester United, especially given the fact that Eric Ten Hag is going to be there? Yeah, linking up with his, his old coach again, it, it all kind of makes sense from, from that point of view. I think Manchester United are crying out for a dominant personality to play in midfield. They're going to lose Matic. They're going to lose Mata. Not that he played much. They're going to lose Pogba as well. So Frankie de Jong could be the, the big star of the midfield. And the point that you made earlier is a good one, that at Barcelona, he's not necessarily the star, is he? He's just one of them, if you know, Gavi and, and, and Busquets and, and the rest of it in that midfield. So I think it's a nice stage. I think the big question is, does Frankie de Jong actually want to go and play in a club that are not in the Champions League? Because that's where Manchester United are at the moment. But he might be getting advice to say, look, it's a great stage for you. So, yeah. You could see it happening if they can make the money. Makes sense. Barcelona probably only want to sell him because they need to do deals. We know they're skint. Um, and if they want to get Bernardo Silva, there's talk of that from Manchester City, where they're going to have to get De Jong sold. So it'll be a great deal, I think, for Manchester United to get Frankie De Jong. And it would be a big statement if they got him. Uh, well, you mentioned it there, the Bernardo Silva rumours right now could be dependent on if Frankie de Jong does move on. Linked yesterday, as we talked about Mundo Deportivo, saying Bernardo Silva is an option. Well, after the Portugal game, he actually spoke about this situation. Bernardo Silva himself saying, unfortunately, I can't say anything. I am focused on the national team. When the season ends, we'll see what happens.
Yeah. Well, it sounds like he's saying a little bit of something without saying anything there, Stevie. Do you know what I find strange? If somebody comes to me right now, if I'm Bernardo Silva or anybody else, and they say, Barcelona interested in you, the first thing I'm thinking about is not should I or shouldn't I go. Hold on a second. They've already signed players that, that can't get paid. How are they going to get me? I mean, if we, if we want to... If we want to talk about fairy stories, then it's fantastic that Bernardo Silva could go to Barcelona, both for him and for Barcelona. But how's it going to happen with anybody? So if I'm a player, regardless of what my name is, I'm thinking, how can I go to Barcelona? Now, does that mean that Barcelona is the only team that's had any interest in them? Because again, if I'm the player, and I've got a Bayern Munich, and I've got a Barcelona, and I'm looking at a Barcelona, they can't sign anybody, they've got all kinds of financial problems, I'm, I'm, going, to be, I'm going to be rethinking what I'm doing here. Has there been much talk about this back in England, Jules? Bernardo Silva moving to Barcelona? This obviously coming from the Spanish press. Yeah, but we, we, we had the same information here, uh, and in the sense that it's pretty clear that the discussion between Barcelona and and Bernardo's people is like, once we sell the young, then we can, we can look into this. But I think before they had to test the market and see if he would be willing to go if that, if that situation arises, and which clearly I think he is open for it. Let's not forget that despite the very good season that he's had, well, it's only the first six months of the season. After that, it was a bit, after the turn of the year, it was a bit more difficult for him. But he thought he was going to leave the summer before, you know, last summer. So he ended up staying. Great, but I think if in your if in your mind you thought at some point going that you thought maybe the manager didn't really trust in you anymore, even if then you played the law, I think that that desire maybe is, is still there. So this can happen. But Stevie is right. Barca can't even register their own cleaners. So let alone a Bernardo Silva or a Lewandowski or someone like that. So Sergio Roberto was done today. Well done to them. But they would need big sales, not just the young, I think, even others, before even thinking about Bernardo Silva, Lewandowski, Kessi, Christensen and all the others. Uh, in terms of the, the player himself, Ian, yesterday on the show we spoke about the fact that City have brought new options in for the next season, that at times Bernardo Silva was the best player for City last season. But do you think there would be a concern for him? that in the new campaign, he might be pushed to the sidelines, given the new names that are coming in and the attacking options they already have. Well, possibly, because we were in this scenario, you might remember, about a year ago, all the stories were ahead of this season that Bernardo Silva might be on his way out. As it happened, he starred for Manchester City. He was brilliant for most of the campaign and was voted in the Professional Footballers Association Team of the Year. So he was that good. I mean, he'd be a terrific pickup. For Barcelona, if they can, if they can make it happen, it does seem, doesn't it, from what he said there? I can't say anything at the moment, as if something is going on. Otherwise, he would have just said, "Look, what are you talking about? I'm a Manchester City player. I, I love it there. I'm going to stay." So, maybe he has got itchy feet. Maybe he is a, li a little bit worried going forward that he will not be a regular starter. But on the form he showed this last season, you just wouldn't leave him out. Uh, for more talk on all the latest topics in world football, be sure to check out the Gab and Jules podcast. And of course, if you want to see more of Jules, although it's uh, Stuart Robson that you'll be hearing this week. Gab staying behind with Stuart. Jules is on his travels. Absolutely brilliant stuff. Uh, Stevie will be the talk of extra time. You'll see why if you stick around for hey, it. That's a mistake next. anybody Maybe. can have made. Yeah, all right. Welcome into the latest edition of Extra Time. We've got Stevie Craig and Ian here to answer your tweets. You've been sending them in. And the first one is for Stevie Nicholl. Stevie, rank in order of how much you hate <laughs> England, Manchester United or the dentist. Oh, well, the dentist is thought. That tells you how much I dislike <laughs> the other two. I've got you say Man United probably would be the top England second. Even though you had them ahead of Liverpool this season, at the beginning yes. of the season. Yes. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> yeah, there was no emotion involved in that. All right. That's why. Fair enough. Uh, the other guys could probably, well, not Ian as much, but Craig could probably weigh in on that well, one. England, Manchester United or the dentist, in order of which you dislike most? I only dislike the dentist. <laughs> <laughs> I don't dislike England or Man United, unlike him. I'm not, I'm not a hater. 
Yes. <laughs> yeah, right. It doesn't. I'm not a hater. <laughs> Just telling it like it is. That's all it is. Oh, that's fine. All right. Not Craig. a hater. Explain the technique of your beautifully chipped goal against Norway in the 1998 World Cup. The technique? Well, the technique is I'd no other option, basically. Because uh, when the ball came over the top of the centre halves and bounced, it really only left me with one option. So think about it if, you're a, if you play golf, it's just like hitting a soft chip. So just on that occasion, I managed to get it right. Under the uh, under that spotlight, so yeah, it's not ask not him, much. Ask, it. Go ask on. him to explain the technique of his beautifully coiffured blonde hairdo he had in 1998. I can also <laughs> explain right. the technique oh, for. I can also explain the well. The technique for that is you got the local hairdresser in Avignon or San Remy in the south of France, and they don't have any idea what you're saying. Stevie, and you try to tell them you want some blonde mullet. <laughs> and, so, and I can also I can also explain to you a very aggressive technique for kicking Moroccan players and getting sent <laughs> off. What you do is what you do is when a guy goes past you, you swing your leading foot very hard uh, and intentionally high, thus. Uh, Thus stopping one's opponents in its tracks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you like, go. Like, Craig, though, how often do you think about that goal? Do you think about it like regularly? Oh, daily, yeah, daily. <laughs> like, <laughs> when I'm playing I golf, know, I think. I know no, there's some sarcasm there, but I always wonder things like this. Uh, we don't think about that. No. No? Not until somebody brings it up, like this question here, then you remember. Yeah, no, it's not like I said, thinking about it. I mean, it's, it was nice. I mean, it was really nice, to be honest, to be able to do that and be fortunate enough to score and play in World Cups. You know, to get a goal there was great. But, uh, yeah, I don't... I don't. It's happened. It's, it's, it's like the blonde hair and the red card. It's happened. <laughs> it's, it's in the past. It was, it was nice at the time. It seems a long time ago. Holy smokes. Um, it was a That was the ago, World Cup, Craig. Craig, that was the World Cup where the Romanian team caused the commentators a complete nightmare because they decided they'd all dye their hair blonde. Um, and we were horrified because we had no real way of identifying them. And when they went out, um, I used the line and said, I think it's proof here that blondes don't always have more fun. <laughs> well, yeah. I wonder then if, if 1998's off the list, because Ian, the question for you is, you've covered several World Cups over the years. Which one was your all-time favourite to be at? Oh, no question about that at all. Italia 90, because it, there was such a passion around the country. I remember every time Italy played, um, there were vans going around with flags waving and horns blaring up until 4 a.m. in the morning. You, you had no chance of sleeping at all. So basically, after every game, we just stayed out and um, had a few drinks and went to bed when we could. I think we ended up one morning actually playing cricket with the hotel manager at 5 a.m. So it, it was that kind of World Cup. It was intoxicating. I don't think the football was great, but it was it was brilliant to cover and, and just be there. Oh, nice. 1990. Is that the World Cup? That's, that, that's the World Cup where apparently, and you may know this, Ian, I don't know, apparently... Some players in Bobby, sir, the late great Sir Bobby Robson, caught Paul Gascoigne playing an anonymous person at tennis in 90 degree heat 24 hours before it might have been the semi final or the quarter final. And uh, they spotted him in the hotel tennis courts outside running around like a daft one. And, got, and, and Gaza got really annoyed when he was told to stop by Bobby Robson because he said it was in the fifth set and he had a chance of winning. <laughs> <laughs> That's Gaza. He, I mean, Bobby called him daft as a brush, didn't he? But yeah. I think, you know, everyone I've ever spoken to who played with him absolutely loved him. Brushes don't know that daft. <laughs> <laughs> daft as Gaza. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> that was that was the World Cup, wasn't it? <clears throat> Tears of yeah. a clown. All right, Craig. Why hasn't Bale been linked to more competitive Premier League sides? In 2021, he scored 11 league goals, 16 total. When he was on loan for half a year for Spurs, he seemed motivated to perform before the Euros. I think, unfortunately, uh, reputation travels. Uh, I don't think there's many will doubt that he could come in and do a job. I suppose they may, behind the scenes, Kay, there could be some clubs talking to him about an incentivised short-term contract. But look, Bale's latter-day issues at Real Madrid have been well documented. Uh, and sometimes, uh, and Stevie will know, have been coached, uh, sometimes a manager doesn't always want that kind of player around. Not always, but sometimes. And I think that's probably just making, putting a few more hurdles in his path. I'm sure he'll get something, but when managers are looking to save their, their bacon, and more, let's be honest, apart from a few, most of them are looking to save their bacon every season. You're looking for people that are going to go to the well for you. And that, that's just not him at, at, at club level anymore. Are you surprised, Ian, that he's not been linked to more Premier League sides? Um, for the same reasons that Craig just itemised, I'm not that surprised. Um, there are stories linking him with the move to Roma, linking him with Jose Mourinho again. That would be uh, that would be quite interesting. I mean, the, the fact is that the World Cup starts in the middle of November. Wales are in it. He's the captain. He's the talisman. He has to play far more than he's played this season. Otherwise, he's just not going to be match up for the World Cup. So. That's going to be his number one priority. I just wonder whether a team like you know Fulham or Bournemouth or Nottingham Forest who are coming up into the Premier League, whether one of their managers might just think, you know what, I could use Gareth Bale. I, I could do with having him around. I know one manager who would have hired him, I'm pretty sure, and that would have been Harry Redknapp if he was still managing a Premier League club. Of course, he isn't. Yeah, well, we know it's not Hitafe, don't we, in La Liga. Yeah. He's, um, he's made that one very clear. Yep. Stevie, hey, listen, if he, wants to go to Not if he wants to go to Nottingham Forest, I'll take some of his potatoes, potatoes if he wants to go in my house. Happy, <laughs> that's it. Happy days. Gareth, if you're watching, there is a house that you can live in, ready-made, yeah. in the Nottingham area, so that you can go and play for Nottingham Forest. With, but he has, but he, has to, he has to put up with my son and his girlfriend. There's the problem. No problems. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. Good luck, says Stevie. As long Stevie. as I've got golf clubs, you're all right. All right, Stevie, was there any amount of money that would have convinced you to play for Manchester United? Probably not, no. Really? After being at Liverpool, no. 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 Nothing? No. So money doesn't talk in this, in this sense? No. No, not at all. Fair enough. Craig, what is it going to take for Scotland to return to international success? Is it time to hire Don Hutchison as coach? Well, you'd have to ask Don what 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 Don's percentage uh, outlook was uh, on the chances of that happening. So, no, unfortunately, it's t unfortunately the Scotland scenario is taking more than good coaches. Stevie Clark did a, has done some great work at club level with tiny budgets. Thinking about Kilmarnock, tiny tiny budget. Uh, you've had. The late Walter Smith, who pretty much seen and done it all, worked with Ferguson, coached, you know, Champions League up to semi, all everything, Strachan, McLeish, ah, oh, the list goes on. <laughs> it's not, it's it's fundamentally a deeper rooted problem than coaching. I'm afraid. Pep Guardiola couldn't get Scotland in the World Cup. Is that bad? Well, it's. It's just a fact. You've got to be realistic. And Scotland have to be realistic. All this, all this nonsense I've been hearing from Scotland about getting rid of Steve Clark. What do they expect Steve Clark to do? They don't have the players. Listen, you're getting outplayed by Ukraine. Technically. How is that down to the manager? The manager can do a lot of things. He can organise you, he can rally you up, he can get you going, he can put you in good positions for whatever talent you have and, 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 the, and put everybody as a unit and make them into, you know, a jigsaw. But ultimately, 
if they're at a level where they're, where they're not good enough to beat an opponent like Ukraine on a technical level, then you just don't have enough. So, as I said, Pep couldn't take Scotland to the World Cup. Never mind Steve Clark, so leave him alone. He's doing all right. Yeah, leave him alone. Oh. All right. For Stevie, what do you make of Wesley Snyder's comments about him saying he could reach the levels of Messi and Ronaldo, but he just loved wine too much and he didn't want to put the effort into it? Well, I think he'd probably had some wine when he came out with that. So I think that sort of says all you need to know. <laughs> he's probably sipping a glass of wine, or his sixth or seventh glass of wine, thinking that. Yeah. Where did that come from, anyway? Wesley Snyder. No, but, yeah, but where did it come from, from Wesley? That's like, that's like me saying, you know what? If I had, like, Budweiser so much, I could have done what Wesley Snyder's done. No chance. Not a chance. He has said things like this before. What, what do you think, To be Ian? fair, to, to be fair, it's, it's like, that's like saying, you know, if Stevie wasn't so enthralled by buying his golf clubs on eBay for a cheap price, he could have been like Tiger Woods. <laughs> but that's not. true. I could have been like Tiger Woods. That's and by the way, you. yeah, and yeah, that's all stopping me. I was like, 300 bucks on eBay. What do you want? What do you want for 300 bucks? That's what, hey, that's what, here's you know. what he's not telling you. I don't buy them on eBay. He buys them on eBay for me. <laughs> he does all the dirty do you, work. Do you even know how to buy something on eBay? No, well, he does it for me. <laughs> Got well, my I had, I had here. My, I, had my, <laughs> uh, I had my orders for a driver a couple of years ago. It was, had to be a, had to be a, a brand make. Had to go like a rocket. <laughs> Extra yards. Had to be under a hundred bucks and have the right shaft. There we go. Oh. <laughs> and I managed. I managed key. And do you know what, what this they got me do you know what this No I did he hit it well and then he then he decided See? he wasn't playing anymore. See? So was that thing wrong? He's, ha he's having a sabbatical. Uh and they say, what is it they say? They say sometimes the Dutch carry themselves sometimes with a bit of arrogance. There's no sign of that here in Wesley Snyder, is there? <laughs> Bit of arrogance, could have been Messi and Ronaldo. I mean, goodness, good grief. You, you, you must have oh, seen him in his pod. <laughs> what? I was thinking of Wesley Snipes. <laughs> I was thinking of Wesley, Sni Wesley Snyder, the footballer. <laughs> I thought it was the actor. Why would he I have no that? idea. Well, that's why I said, why would he say that? That's why, said, that's, that's, why said, that's why I said. That's why I said. That's why I said. That's like me wanting to do what Wesley Snyder did. Did you not think that was a bit strange? No. I mean, you come out with a few things on here, so I just thought. Sorry, I was thinking of Wesley Snyder. Well, now you know it's with the Dutch midfielder Wesley Snyder. What do you think? I don't know. I'm, I'm lost. I'm, I'm kind of. Befuddled. <laughs> uh, just to reiterate, we're talking about Wesley Snyder, Ian, and not Wesley yeah. Snipes, the actor. You must have seen yeah. Snyder in his prime. How far off do you think he was from the likes of Messi and Ronaldo? Uh, I think Wesley Snyder, the actor, was a very fine midfield player. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, Wesley What's Snyder was a, was a top class, you know, world class midfield player. Of course he was. You know, that uh, team that got to the World Cup final. Um, yeah, great player, but. Hey, look, who's in the same class as Messi and Ronaldo? Almost nobody in history. So I think when he said that, like Stevie said, I think he might have had a couple of glasses of that wine, or either that or he's got a very vivid imagination. <laughs> well, hey, now that we're on the subject, name me a Wesley Snipes film. Come on. Go on. I couldn't. You could. I just know he was, he's, a, he's an actor. Was it, you, has you he not been involved with your films? Was it not, about, was it not one, one of, uh, involved aeroplanes? Oh, um, um, um. Not, not Con Air. Blade. No. He was in Blade. What else? Yeah, he was in Blade. Star of that. I can't believe we've got, I can't believe oh. we've sat here and that, that donut actually thought we were talking about Wesley Snipes. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> it's gonna make me laugh for weeks, you know. I saw it, I saw it earlier and I thought, oh, Wesley Snipes. <laughs> Oh, why would he say that? <laughs> but even so, how do you know that he wasn't a great footballer? <laughs> and he was a better actor, so that's what he decided to go into? Well, many great footballers, you know, <laughs> would make good actors. 
And don't say Frank. Frank. Don't say Frank. I said good actors. <laughs> oh, that's not nice. He's not here to defend himself. All right. Craig, would you ever weigh yourself before and after the game? How exhausting is it to play a full game of competitive football? And also, does training ever come close to the real thing? Not really, no. But as it turns out, we used to weigh ourselves a lot at training years and years ago in the old days before before all the uh, sports scientists and stuff. And you used to wear, I'm sure Stevie did as well, but we used to always have something in the old days called wet tops. And they were basically, they would help you sweat during training. But it became apparent through people who knew what they were talking about that really you're, you're not losing weight. You're just dehydrating yourself at the time you're losing fluid. And you put it all straight back on, uh, usually after training. So I've seen guys wearing two or three of these. And hard, I, I know guys uh, that used to wear two and three of these wet tops to, to try and lose weight, get a sweat on. They'd hardly run about. They would be lazy as hell. And then they'd be sweating after it. But And then they'd, they'd be convinced that they'd lost like, oh, I've lost eight pounds a day and all that. And all you've done, all you've done is drained yourself of some fluid and it all, go, all goes back on. But but no, never before and after a game. No, no, you're either you're either in shape and ready to play, or you're out of shape and you're fat. I mean, it, you kind of know where you are. We we only ever got got weighed at the start of the season. Yeah, that was it. And you, when you came back. But would you not get on the scales other than that? No, no. no. There would there would always be a couple of guys who would always just because of the way they are would carry. Like when I got when I got to Liverpool in, in 81, a guy called Ray Kennedy, who's a fantastic player, he used to train every day with a black bin liner under his gear. Yeah. You know, they got they got a little more sophisticated in ten years later in Craig's Craig's decade with, with sweat tops. In the early 80s, he used a black bin liner underneath all your gear. And and as he said, all it did was dehydrate you. It doesn't take weight off, it dehydrates you and then you stand on the scales and you kid yourself on, you've lost weight. But the next morning, when you're rehydrated, you're the same weight. Uh, yeah, a bin liner, also known as a trash bag. In Sorry, a trash bag. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Oops. Wait, 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 on the scales, wait. please, Nico, on the scales. <laughs> well, that's the only thing <laughs> I'm thinking. If there's some Nicole. managers that have put you on a strict regime and you do have to make a hey, certain listen. weight. Listen, would, hey, would nobody used to do that. that. What, what the hell chance do you think? Who's gonna who's gonna get him in a strict regime? Who oh, used Jesus. to do <laughs> that? You didn't let's be honest, you didn't need to do that with there was there was the odd guy who needed it. But generally everybody was fit as a fiddle. They weren't they weren't they were the odd ones out, the ones that had to be weighed, and anybody had to speak to them. My goodness, you're running about in your twenties, you you're carrying nothing. Yeah, exactly. Fighting All weight, right. King. Fighting weight at that fighting point. Fighting weight. You know what, I mean? you, um, what was your fighting weight? <laughs> uh, a lot less than it is now. I, I'm going to say, well, I'm guessing, I don't really know. 175? Is that a lot? What's that? If Ian's got to weigh in here. Yeah. Maybe was, um, was 12 1. Well, commentators don't have to weigh in. Or, you know, nobody should give them that idea. Um, <laughs> don't the players now, they get weighed every week, don't they? Um, no, but in the old days was... where you went away for the summer and, and, and went on the beach and ate, you know, French fries and burgers all summer and let themselves down, I think that well, doesn't happen as well. They off, they're weighed the whole time. Uh, no, but Ian, what would Craig have been fighting at at 175? Oh, sorry, well, Craig... Oh, what did he say, 175? Yeah. Uh, yeah, sounds about ah, sort of right. Yeah, so that's a weight, wouldn't it? Maybe a bit less, even. Maybe more right. like one. That's heavier than me. So you think more than me? That's a bit twelve. One, that's one seventy-five is about what twelve and a half. Mm. So I was about, like half a stone lighter than him when I played. Yeah, but I'm taller than you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but fatter. <laughs> I'm taller than you. <laughs> I, I would say one. I can't remember one seventy. Yeah, but between. I think, thinking back, between somewhere always between 12 and 12 and a half stones wow. in the old. In the old days. Yep. Stones, no money. pounds. All right. Stevie, why do you hate Jose Mourinho that much? 
I heard you laughing sarcastically when he was linked with the PSG job. He was successful in all the biggest leagues in Europe and he won the Champions League with Porto and Inter. So respect the greatest manager ever. The greatest manager ever, right. I don't, I don't hate Jose Mourinho. Just that he says an awful lot of things, right? And not everything he says is correct. A lot of things he says are, are correct, but a lot of things he said are complete and utter nonsense. So whenever he talks nonsense, then I just pull him up on it. I don't hate the guy. I, I just think that sometimes he, he just goes too far. You know, to, how, can you, how, can you, how can you take someone seriously, right? How can you take someone serious, I should say, who brags and tries to make out that the charity shield is some sort of uh, big trophy to be won. It's not. So you want me to take that serious? And clearly the guy who wrote this, this, this uh, sent this tweet in, thinks that winning the, the charity shield is anything. It's nothing. You know who was standout under Jose Mourinho during his win at Inter? Who? Wesley Snyder. Wesley Snipes. Wesley Snipes, <laughs> Wesley Snipes yeah. No, if, I'll tell you what, if he had got Wesley Snipes to play as well as Wesley Snyder, then he would have been the best manager ever. Put it that way. But sadly... Not. Sadly, he did not. Uh, thanks Correct. so much for sending in your tweets uh, and for the giggles as well. Yeah, Wesley Snyder, not Wesley Snipes. Now, if we've, if we've got... I'll tell you what, if we've got anything about us now, we'll get Wesley Snipes on this show next week. Right? <laughs> right. There you go. Yeah, big time. <laughs> there you go, production team. There's your new assignment. Thanks so much for sending in your tweets. I will do it all again tomorrow.